I've never seen so many early stage companies doing so many cool new things and bringing them to market in record time. I've never seen a period where people are innovating this quickly and bringing new products to market. Welcome to Startupville, the show where we discuss what it's like to build a tech startup and a startup ecosystem in a small city. I'm Mike Wolsfeld, our host is Dan Gold, and we're having conversations with tech leaders in our community about how they're working through the current global economic crisis and the larger implications on their sectors. Today we're talking with Jeff Dick, Director of Engineering with Mentor, a Siemens company. He was involved with the largest tech acquisition in province history when their startup Solito was acquired by Mentor in late 2017, and since then they've continued to grow their team. Jeff has been an invaluable mentor and thought leader for early stage startups in the Saskatchewan tech community. We had a great conversation with Jeff about many things, like breaking down the last half year from pre-pandemic to the massive shift to working from home in March, and on to what he describes as a new golden age of tech and innovation spurred on by the pandemic. We also talked about some local examples of startups that have stepped up to the challenge. And he gave his thoughts on how the acceleration towards more globalized, decentralized workforces can impact both employees and employers. Welcome to Startup Bill. Startup Bill is brought to you by Innovation Place and Martin Charlton Communications. Jeff, these are these are challenging times. Uh, there's been an awful lot of change. There's been a change in mindset how organizations are treating uh, their relationship with technology. Uh, let's start from the very beginning. What have you noticed from January to now? Well, you know, January was a great time. You know, uh, investment was plentiful in our environment. The stock market was doing well. You know, tech stocks were doing well. Uh, everything was was pointing the right direction. It had been for quite some time. Uh, we started seeing some supply issues uh, due to the pandemic, uh, you know, uh, in China and some of the early stage startups that depend on hardware suppliers were starting to report problems. Uh, bike Tricks, for example, was having trouble getting bikes. Uh, Tave, uh, it's a Winnipeg company. Bike, bike Tricks, a Saskatoon e-bike company. Tave was reporting, you know, uh, challenges getting uh, hardware. Uh, but, you know, things were generally pretty good for, for everybody. Um, and uh, then what happened was, was this cliff, right? It, it happened really, really, like, I think this was the fastest, the fastest cliff that I've ever seen, you know, things like the, the 2000 bubble burst was kind of similar, right? Like it was just this really, really rapid, but it wasn't just tech companies. It was everybody went boom. And, uh, and uh, that was pretty interesting. And, uh, you know, we started operating under, you know, what our, our company Siemens deemed as, the most uncertain time that we've had in you know 50 plus years and uh, and how do you create projections how do you plan for that and as an early stage company you know how do you how do you buckle down and, and make sure you can weather things so what I saw people doing first is saying how am I going to survive right what am I going to do to survive this how much does it impact me uh, are all my customers going to stop paying you know companies like seven shifts who sell to restaurants or Tave who sells to restaurants or salon scale who sells to hair salons, they were on the front lines of this and saying, what do we got to do to survive? Will this ever come back? How long is it going to last? And they went into this really uh, gritty survival mode. They went from growth mode to gritty survival mode. And, um, and that was pretty interesting. But then the second stage of what happened was people started saying, I want to still matter. I'm not going to sit here and wait. And they started getting really creative. So we saw this unanticipated golden age of innovation startup, which was really cool. You know, like this is, I've never seen so many early stage companies doing so many cool new things and bringing them to market in record time. I've never seen a period where people are innovating this quickly and bringing new products to market. I've got a bunch of examples of that. I think maybe we'll get into that and talk about it because it's pretty interesting. Some of that stuff is going to have a lot of relevance beyond the pandemic, you know, it's, it's new classes of products that, that, that were getting brought back, brought to market very, very quickly. Uh, funding's kind of dried up. That's been interesting. Early stage funding, all the, the uh, seed funds and, and early stage tech funds 
are shoring up capital and saying, let's keep the companies that we've already invested in alive with the money we have. So it's hard to get new funds, I think. Um, you know, one company, uh, Tave, I, I talked about them a couple of times already. They were in Y Combinator and Y Combinator had a virtual uh, demo day. And like there was, you know, record low amount of investment that came out of that. You know, people just didn't invest in Y Combinator companies even, which was fascinating. So there was this massive shift as people kind of buckled down. And then we saw it go the other direction. It's sort of been a V-shaped recovery. Uh, stock market, you can see, is a lot of the stock markets right back up. My industry, my customers have mostly rebounded right back up. And uh, we're seeing it in a lot of areas, you know, the, the ones that are still following last, you know, restaurants, hotel chains, airlines, that kind of thing. They're still, they're still waiting and so are all their suppliers, but there's signs of them starting to turn back on too. And, and people aren't scared anymore, I don't think. Uh, at least that's what the financial uh, sector shows. They're less scared than they were a, a week ago or a month ago or two months ago. So, so. Jeff, where this kind of takes me as a question is, you know, no one's got a crystal ball for what's happening around the corner. No one can predict, you can manage, you can mitigate, you can uh, ride out a storm. But when the capital dries up, when the money simply isn't there and you do go into that survival mode and you furlough stuff or, or, or just downsize to ensure that there is a, an entity to exist on the other side of this, how does that affect a founder, someone whose identity is this rapid growth, this success? How does it, how does it come back on them with that resilience or the pressure that they feel and the responsibility to their staff? I think it's a horrible moment when you realize that, okay, we need to survive and surviving means uh, going back on all of the growth promises that I've given to the staff. You know, a lot of people are sort of used to just good news. You know, these, these companies that are gaining traction and finding the ramp and, and closing uh, investment rounds. And so they're used to winning and they don't know what, they don't know what this looks like. You know, a bad day is when you don't hit your growth projections. And, but it's not a day where you don't even have growth projections anymore. You're just surviving. And um, I talked to a lot of founders, uh, uh, you know, in, in March. And they were just, it was dark. You know, it was, they were having uh, some of the worst days of their lives telling some of their staff, you know what? I need to lay you off for a while. Maybe not forever, but for a while. And I don't know uh, if... And, you know, they're, they're talking about this to their board. I mean, they're, they're all saying, hey, let's just do one wave. We don't want to keep, you know, we don't want to die a, a death, to, you know, a, a thousand deaths. We just want to do this once and, and uh, you know, cut back and, and, then, and then kind of build up again when we can. But, um, you know, they, they're not even sure if they're cutting enough or if they're cutting too much. It's just this complete uncertainty. And there's, you know, human jobs at stake, you know, at a time where it's not easy to just go find a different job either. Right. So it's, it, it's the, it was the hardest thing for quite a few of the founders to do. Some of them managed to find really cool ways to keep all their staff though, which was really cool. They, they did some pay cuts, you know, not, 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 uh, I didn't see any pay cuts for, you know, for the workers and nothing for the executives. It was like across the board, you know, people, people bringing down, pay across the board. And I also saw some really crafty use of, uh, of programs like, uh, like IRAP and so on to, you know, cover staff. So IRAP came out with some really fast money uh, and, uh, and started approving projects faster. And that helped companies to, to keep their staff and, and put more of the salaries and spend under IRAP, which was super helpful. But it was it was a tough time. March sucked for for our tech founders. March was March, March was the worst month ever for our for our tech founders. But you mentioned this golden age of technology, this golden age of uh, problem solving. If we just put it as simply as that, uh, applying technology to different problems. I'm very intrigued uh, to to hear what you've observed, to find out what you've seen. So this is more talking about April now. So March is figure out how to survive and April was figure out how to become relevant again. So if you're in a, in a space where, um, where your customers aren't making money, 
uh, you're not going to either, right? It's really help, hard to sell things to people that don't have any money, right? That are that are sur in survival mode themselves. And so what we saw, uh, you know, let's let's look at uh, coconut software, for example. You know, they they actually they came out very very quickly. They they looked at this. I, I was really impressed with the pace because they're not that small of a company, right? Like they're a pretty decent sized company, and the pace at which they were able to say, okay what's our strategy here for doing, for, you know, turning lemons into lemonade. And they made, you know, like a book from home type system uh, uh, that uh, actually led to really good sales. So they actually backed off on in, in March, like many companies did, they went into survival mode and then they did some things that actually drove revenue up, you know, this whole book from home uh, and, uh, kind of, and it, and it actually worked really well and, and their, their revenues actually started climbing at an accelerated rate, which is really cool. Uh, I love that. Um, if you look at seven shifts, you know, they're selling to restaurants. That's, that's a tough place to be. And they didn't get hit super hard because still, you know, places they're doing takeout and delivery, they still need to schedule staff and so on. So not everyone, th their revenues didn't just go to zero because they don't just supply eat in restaurants, but, but it was certainly pressure and there was a lot of uncertainty and they said, well, Hey, let's start helping companies. To, to, let's start helping our customers to deal with COVID to switch from dine in to uh, the delivery models. If you go look on their website, they've got all this advice that they wrote, and uh, and there's some buzz about new products uh, that sort of uh, help with kind of the new world order too that they're they're developing out really quickly. So, you know, there's a couple of our of our leaders uh, responding, you know, it, getting hit really hard uh, and responding extremely quickly. Um, safety Tech, another really good example. So they sell. Uh, safety, uh, safety management software to construction companies and construction was projected to, you know, do, do this, but who knows how far it will dive kind of thing. And they were going into survival mode too. And Ryan, the CEO there told me, you know, people just stopped returning my calls and I'm not used to this. I don't know what to do about it. You know, and he very, very quickly came up with a new product, which was a workplace COVID safety uh, product that was free. So this was the first time he'd done a freemium kind of model where you introduce this for free, you get all these new leads and they're starting to convert to paying customers, which is really cool. And, and that's actually created a whole new business model for him that he, he didn't have before. So, you know, really good stuff there. Uh, Better cart, uh, Melanie Morrison, uh, she's a very, very good early stage uh, tech leader. Uh, she looked and she said, what do our shoppers need? Well, they need to find, you know, who's got hand sanitizer, who's got toilet paper, you know, all the things that were getting hoarded. And uh, she made a, uh, 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 basically a social stock tracking system where you could go in, into any grocery store and say, oh, these guys have got these things, these COVID things, just kind of quick point and click uh, type thing. And it, and it generated a whole pile of traffic to her, to her application, you know, and, uh, you know, just just fantastic examples like this. And one of the companies I work the most closely with, uh, Tave, they're out of Winnipeg. I think they still count. They're honorary startup bill uh, 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 a company. I think they, they come. It's to on the prairies. I'll go with it. It's fine. They hang out. They hang out a lot here, and, uh, <laughs> and, and really like our community and participate actively. But uh, they were selling to restaurants. They're selling a, a product that replaced commercials, uh, TV commercials, with your own content, so you could use it to upsell. And their model was, you know, you pay them a monthly fee, which was a fairly, fairly substantial fee. And now it's really hard to collect money and they've converted to a completely different model while well, they're offering it as well. Uh, but a model where they actually can pay restaurants. So, Hey, do you want, do you want free money at a time uh, where you're strained? You know, they're not asking for money. They're actually writing checks to restaurants with this new model. And, uh, and that's been a lot easier to sell in a time where, where people are struggling for cash. So some really creative stuff. Some of it's going to last as long as the pandemic. The pandemic's going to last for a while still. People are going to care for another year or something. You know, it's, it's, there's a good window there. Um, but some of this, a lot of this stuff is going to last post-pandemic. We're going to see all, all kinds of new products. And this is, I think the thing to recognize here is we're talking about in the month of April, people launched all these new things. That doesn't happen where you launch a pile of new products in one month, two months. And we're seeing it not just in our community, but all across the world. All these companies that used to be relevant became less relevant right now, and they found new ways to be relevant really, really quickly, which is super cool. This is, this is the golden age of, 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 uh, of innovation driven by a pandemic. It's really neat. 
it's always interesting to look at the history books, to learn from history how innovation is uh, forced by situations and scenarios and, and how we react to a situation and what we do as a as a result of it and the inventions that have come out of previous downturns or major incidents around the world and i don't see as now is any different to that and i i, I never thought <clears throat> pardon me I never thought that I would live through a state of emergency during my lifetime. I never saw that coming. So when you look at these businesses and just think, well, how could they have planned for these things? I th I would actually like to say that a lot of this comes down to the pure talent that is within these organisations and the willingness to turn that talent to solve problems, not only for the for the need to survive, but the innovative thinking to go, hey, we've got a solution that does this, but it could also apply to this, but it needs a bit of an iteration to do that. And the talent can see that through. And what I'd add to that is, I think that the th the firms here on the prairies that I've, I've been tracking and following for Startupville and just out of my personal interest, the thing I'd like to say is, I think a lot of them have com communicated incredibly well uh, to to what the change in offer is, to what it is that they're doing, how they're willing to help. And they've also listened. Big strength of this time. The listening has been truly incredible. I was speaking to someone on Friday at a, a tech company who's going to be on a future episode. Don't want to spoil it. Very exciting. Um, and they were saying... You know, we, we looked inwards, then we looked outwards, and then we started listening. We just listened. We were we were numb for a period of time, but then that numbness enabled us to take stock and look at where we truly were and what the marketplace needed. And did, was it our marketplace that needed something or someone else's? And we could help there as well. So I do have a question for you where... Um, I think there's a, whether it's a dichotomy or a crossroads, <clears throat> there's a big campaign to support local. I understand it. I appreciate it. I think it's necessary. But at the same time, when people are truly working together, regardless of their geographical location, uh, speaking to people in different territories, in different time zones, suddenly there's been a mindset of, oh, right, we don't all need to gather in New York. We don't all need to gather at a conference in wherever. We don't need to da, 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 to make something happen. We can truly collaborate internationally. And we can scale a product internationally. And we can do that from here. But at the same time, there's a pressure in a campaign, understandably, to say support local, support local, support local. So how do you reconcile those two pieces? Yeah, I, this this to me isn't even really a pandemic question for my own context because uh, for for me at Salido and Mentor uh, within Siemens, uh, all of our customers are international. Uh, we've been we've been working with customers in an international community for fifteen years, and what was local was was our was our staff, our team, and so the the piece that's gotten uh, this is actually a really neat uh, uh, question for me because. Uh, what happened is post acquisition uh, for Salido, uh, mentors actually got uh, teams all over the place, and and um, uh, I ended up getting teams in France and Portland and a, a small team in the Bay Area, and they all kind of worked as you know four separate teams under four separate roofs for the most part, with a little bit of collaboration, you know, sort of big rocks back and forth. But now you send everyone home and you say, "Boof, go scatter," and all of a sudden people across geographies and, and, and different offices started working better together, I think. So it's active as, as uh, some glue between my, my own remote, remote teams. Uh, well, they're all remote from each other relatively, right? But uh, uh, they've, they're, they're actually working better together. Um, one of the things that I've seen though too is that this whole, you know, go scatter and then try to, try to figure out how to collaborate it works really well when you start this with momentum. You know, we went into this with people that have been working together under one roof or two or three or four roofs or however many uh, for years. 
and they knew what they were doing and they just, you know, okay, grab my laptop and go work from home today. And, you know, I'm just going to do the same thing as I was going to do from the office. So there's all this, you know, vision and, uh, and camaraderie and stuff that has been built up. And I think it's really hard to start from there. So how do we sustain this? You know, how do you create it globally? How do you create, you know, what, what happens under one roof? How do you actually create that uh, globally? We're not good at that yet, I don't think. And how do you sustain it once you've got momentum? You know, what I'm predicting, we can sort of, I don't know if it's a good time to start transitioning into the how, how are people working differently uh, question, but it's, uh, um, you know, I think what we're seeing is, is high performance uh, remote distributed teams because they were high performance together before. And it's really hard to create that. So you're sort of saying, I think your question is, you know, how do you, how do you create this globally? Well, I think we're still trying to crack that code like we were before the pandemic and the, and the really effective teams that are all working distributed and remotely are mostly doing that because they were before, but it has unblocked some, some of the, the cross geography relationships more than, 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 than we'd seen with people working in offices together, which is kind of neat. Hey, it kind of reminds me, there was that post that went around, um, uh, I don't know, it must have been about six weeks ago, which was um, what encouraged you to uh, to evolve or iterate your, your uh, technology, to move on with the technology that you have as an organisation. Was it your CEO, CTO, or was it actually COVID-19? And for a lot of organisations, they are um, fearful of being multi-center when they're small because of you know the connections and the relationships and i i've seen two very distinct things happen one companies which are very used to the relationship of being in a single office uh, collaborating in a in an open space together have had at point difficulties being more remote and not having those daily interactions, this you know, it's the the soft skills, the ability to engage with each other in that way, um, you know, the cooler talk, talking in the kitchen, by the copy, or whatever it may be. Yet at the same time, there are organisations that have really truly succeeded because they already gave their teams uh, and individuals a level of autonomy to go, hey, we trust you, go and go and do these. Uh, we trust you, go go and do these tasks let's check in and and i i i don't know whether some people need to be physically in the same airspace or some people thrive from not being in the same airspace so as someone who has seen uh the change in your workplace from how people interact on the daily um what have you noticed as as comes from opportunities for flexible working maybe that comes from this yeah this is huge um you know we've seen some big companies like uh, shopify and facebook very vocally say we don't we don't even care if people come to the office anymore you know going forward you can everybody can work from home and that creates a huge opportunity because now uh you know they they can expand their workforce anywhere they can find talent and and uh and, uh, you know, people in regions where they don't get paid as much as people at Facebook in the Bay Area, do, you know, it might be some good opportunities for, for, uh, for, for some raises <laughs> and, and stuff. It's, it's created this, uh, this, this global workforce uh, if companies are serious about that. And, um, you know, I think that's really exciting. That changes. That's a, win for, uh, that's a win for companies because now they have more opportunities in terms of where they can hire people. It's a win for a lot of workers because a lot of people, especially if you, it's not so much in, in, in the prairies here because our commutes aren't that bad, but imagine if you got to commute an hour a day, or, you know, back and forth and rush hour traffic, working from home's not so bad, right? Like this is, this is way better for lifestyle, uh, you know, as long as you can avoid cabin fever that comes with it. Uh, I think it's way better for lifestyle for workers. So it's a win for workers. And it's also a win for customers and suppliers for those relationships, because instead of having to go drive to your customer to be able to look after them, you look good at working with them remotely. And sometimes you can do a lot faster, snappier interactions with them. Um, and so I think it's, it's sort of, you know, like a triple win uh, there. Um, one of the things that I predict, though, is that um, the office actually serves a purpose, you know, and, and 
we were forced into the world's largest immediate beta test of working from home. It was amazing how fast, you know, even big companies that were saying, oh yeah, we're not gonna you know, set up VPNs for people or give them access to data, they gotta come into the office, security or apathy or whatever it was that was mistrust of their staff, whatever was caused there. They just like that all said, okay, we're gonna put all the pieces in place so people can work from home. And, and uh, it, was, it was the world's largest beta test where all of a sudden, you know, every company that still wanted to matter was, was part of this beta test of working from home and they'd learned to trust their staff and they'd learned to support their staff and they're still learning how to get their staff collaborating. But I think one of the things that we didn't test is what happens in the long term if you have your teams dispersed. I think if you do simple work, like let's say you're just sort of in maintenance mode on a product and the day-to-day -day is more incremental, I think teams like that can probably work from home forever. If you're uh, building something fundamentally new and revolutionary, I think it's gonna be a lot harder because sometimes a lot of the fast-paced collaboration happens between the right group of individuals in front of a whiteboard. And I don't know if you'd see that, that same kind of performing pace if you take that away. And shared whiteboards on, you know, uh, on WebEx or Zoom or, I mean, that's not what I'm talking about. Those are terrible, like they just don't work, right? Uh, you don't get the same quality of interaction at all um, there. So I think offices are still gonna matter. And I think it matters for uh, building rapport with people too, you know, if we're actually together and, and, and you know, feeling the, that kind of group buy-in that, that, you know, that kind of happens from spending time together, you know, people, people operate better, they perform better. And I think you take that away, for the short term, you know, we're going to operationally survive. We're going to keep doing things. We can even innovate. We can even, you know, continue off that, that great momentum that we had. We can continue that. But if you take it away for six months or a year or five years or permanently, I think a lot of, a lot of the ability to uh, create at, at a really high level of performance becomes fairly challenging. And I don't think that's a solved problem remotely. So what I expect will happen, this is what I'm gonna do with my team, is we're gonna have some new rules about working from home. You know, if you wanna work a day or two from home a week, I think that's probably where we're gonna go, but I want people in the office together for some period of time to, to be able to you know, keep building that momentum. Um, some people work better from the office. Um, they've got distractions. Uh, they've got, you know, a lot of our homes are, yeah, yeah that's right, kids and, uh, kids and pets and, you know, fun stuff too, you know, our, our houses aren't necessarily built as workplaces, you know, you go there to, to kick back, you know, after work and have fun with your friends on the weekend and, and your family uh, outside of work. And that's what they're designed for a lot of the time. And so they're not work workplaces and people aren't good at working there sometimes. And, um, uh, and some people work better from home where they've got a great little place, that they, a corner they can go into and stick their headphones on. People aren't interrupting them ever. Uh, and, uh, and they don't have to commute. So they save, you know, in Saskatoon, you save 15 minutes twice a day. In, in the Bay Area, you save two hours. And maybe that's time you put into work. So they're actually more productive. And I think, you know, depending on the individual, how they've got their home life set up and just their discipline too. Some people can uh, do great work when other people aren't looking and some people it's not because they're worse humans or something It's just they're better at, at performing when other people are looking and uh, And they'll do it more reliably and you know if you kind of know who you are and and uh, and what your workspace is set up for Having more flexibility is great. You know, let's it's, it's all about productivity and, and lifestyle and if we can do better on both fronts we should right and uh, and that's going to be something that is I think different for a lot of companies post pandemic is a lot more flexibility for people who are good at working from home and productive at working from home and want to do it to be able to do it more often. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that one of the key elements to this is how the management of an organization, how HR works with each of those individuals to ensure that the situation and the environment is right for that person. And, and ultimately, there has to be some very honest conversations, because if it doesn't work out, if it isn't the configuration that works for the organization and the individual, then there needs to be a, a reconfiguration. And sure, we're in a an interesting time right now, but 
for for the long term there has to be uh, the big picture and uh, for me when I was working back home I had uh, an hour nearly an hour and a half each way so three hours a day of traveling for me here's where I'm one of those freaky people for me that was some of the most productive time I'd go in on the train I'd work I'd research I'd be writing I'd get to the office I'd be in in a studio environment or working with my tv colleagues or my film colleagues and and working on that material um and and having moved here what because I work between Saskatoon and Regina well how do I get between Saskatoon and Regina I know that that is x number of hours uh driving which isn't productive time so for me actually being doing more from home and more from my office remote to our Regina head office is beneficial I I'm I'm far more efficient but it suits the way that I think and I feel about my work where I like that separation I like the ability to check in but focus in my own space it's just my mindset and and accounting for everyone's differences is going to be where we see success for this for sure as you've said um where I'm particularly intrigued is from the piece that I never say. You will never hear me say new normal. And apologies to listeners, but new normal to me is one of the most frustrating things that we say as a throwaway statement. We are creatures of change. The world constantly changes and we evolve and we deal with it. It's just the rate at which that change happens, whether it's incredibly quick or it's over a prolonged period. So that brings me to asking you, given how uh, you were 100% fully independent previously and now a part of a larger entity, and you clearly have empathy for organisations that are still um, uh, fully independent and, and autonomous, what would you say to them as a piece of advice for their journey if they're concerned with this current downturn about, OK, well, you know, I was looking at trading out in X, Y or Z period. I want to I've got this little little book here where it's got all my other projects that I want to be getting on with. How do you manage the idea around time and patience and looking longer term because of situations like this? So, so for some companies, uh, it's actually been a, a great storm because uh, at when you're an early stage company, you haven't really necessarily hit the fast growth ramp yet. You know, it's it's actually a killer time to build, right? You know, people don't expect you to be delivering, you know, fast revenue growth and you know maybe you learn something new that you should be doing. And it's a great time to build, and it's a great time to uh, to evolve a company and be ready for uh, when when uh, spending turns back on, it's happening quite quickly as, as uh, you know, in, in most spaces, it's happening quite quickly. So I don't think there's that much of a storm to weather for most companies. It's, it was shorter and easier. The, the big doomsday um, projections that people had in March haven't played out that way. This isn't over, you know, it still could happen. There could be, you know, the great second wave, which is a thousand times larger than the first wave or something. <laughs> it won't be a thousand times, but it'd be, you know, there could be the great second. It's, we're, not, we're not done yet, but it sure feels like um, it wasn't as big of an event as what people planned for in our community. So I would say that they don't need advice of, for how to weather the storm from me. They need advice on, you know, like it's kind of, kind of over, you know, go, go, go with some precautions. You know, I think that's actually, that's actually what I think is, is needed now is take that thing that you're building during this, this time and you know, get it to market and get it producing um, because people are starting to spend again. And, uh, and, and this wasn't as bad as, as you prepared for uh, get back into growth mode, maybe, you know, with some, be careful if there's a second wave and it's it's bigger than uh, than you know, know that that could happen. Uh, don't don't go into you know full full on you know fast growth spending mode, but but get back to get back to growing. I think is the main thing. Um, I think also uh, take take the things that we've done creatively that 
created new opportunities that were, you know, in I, the, some of those golden age of innovation pieces that I was talking about. And take COVID out of the name of those and see what happens, you know, make sure that those things are still generally applicable and they're things that we can actually build our companies around. And if they're not, maybe start shifting away from that. You know, it was good for getting some interviews and attracting some attention, but if it's not actually going to be a big part of your new business, get, get out of it. And if it is, start taking COVID out of the name and make it part of your, your business. I think it's, I think that's really important too. If an organization has uh, been going down this path and, and creating a suite of solutions or an individual solutions, solution relating to this COVID time, but it does have long-term application, but it doesn't fit in with the ethos of the rest of the company or the rest of the offer, which could happen, do you think it's a case of, okay, evaluate one or the other and, and stick to a direction, or is it down to the individual company to say, hey, do you know what? This might also be a thing. Maybe we spin that off as a second, th second thing to to uh, uh, protect it from the other side and just almost hedge bets. Could that be an option? Yeah, it depends on how early stage the company is that you're talking about. Because if you've got something and it's not yet working, and you're still trying to find the ramp, you're still trying to find product market fit. And then you say, you know what, I got a different thing. And you start trying to do two things wrong uh, and, and find, <laughs> find the ramp. I mean, that's just, that's, that's kind of a recipe for not necessarily, I think you have to be pretty decisive early stage and decide what the thing is. And it's okay to change, you know, like a, a Slack used to be, you know, a failed game company. And then they, they turned into the world's uh, most awesome uh, text messaging platform, internal collaborate text collaboration platform, you know, it's okay to change what you're doing, but actually change. You know, I think if, if you've got something that's already working and now you're going to launch a second product line around something else that's got a little traction that, that, um, you know, uh, the pandemic has, you know, motivated you to do and enabled and it's got post pandemic value, then by all means, don't kill the first thing because it's working also launch the second and, you know, maybe fund it from the first that's working. And I think that's perfectly valid too, but having, having too many, uh, being too divided on pre product market fit initiatives, isn't a good formula for early stage companies. You pick one thing, do it really well, keep it simple, find the ramp, fund the next thing. Once it's working is, is the way that I like for early stage companies to operate. So maybe if it's a case of doing that split, it's going to be for organizations that are further down the line rather than that. I'm still darting between ideas. I want to or maybe tweak this here and do that there. You could spread yourself too thin and not really focus on anything. Yeah, you know, or switch to the new thing. You know, like it's okay to, I think it's okay to say, hey, you know what, this new idea uh, that we came up for, for uh, to stay relevant during the pandemic is a way better idea than our old idea. Let's just switch to it. Let's do this other thing. I think that's perfectly fine. Jeff, uh, as ever, it's always a pleasure to have you here on Startupville. Frankly, I think we should have you on here more often. Uh, I think we should book you every six months. I th Mike, can we get that done? Yeah, I think I think it's a done deal. Uh, Jeff Dick, thank you so much for joining us here on Startupville. And before you go, uh, if people want to find out more about you and what you're doing, how could they do that? Well, I'm pretty easy to find. Uh, uh, I think... Uh, uh, you know, through through Siemens in Saskatoon, that's sort of my uh, my day job. Uh, Collabs, I'm on the board there, easy to find. And then I'm at every startup event there is because I like being out in the community and uh, and being part of what's going on. So uh, easy to track me down in, in any of those places. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Dan, for having me too. This has been a real pleasure. It's uh, it's always a pleasure, and and uh, I, I love I love this uh, this series. Love love what you're doing here, raising awareness of what's all going on here. Uh, for tech in the prairies uh, jeff we will see you in six months mike is that yeah okay yeah six months <laughs> thanks mike thanks dan we'll see you see you guys later startup bill is brought to you by innovation place helping grow the tech sector in saskatchewan canada and is produced in partnership with martin charlton communications at we tell your stories.ca the show is produced by me mike wolsfeld and our host dan gold our theme music is from GG Riggs and Reactor Productions. Learn more about us and our guests at innovationplace.com slash startupville and 
follow us on Facebook and Twitter at StartupVillePod. See you next time on StartupVille.